Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our pre-Pesach Shir and Q&A being broadcast here from Young Israel of North Beverly Hills. Um, so thank you, everyone, for joining us. It's important that you are here. There's a lot to talk about. Uh, and there's many questions to deal with, and particularly because we're addressing aspects of Pesach that many of us have not addressed before. So usually we have the regular questions, we have the rev regular issues that may crop up when cleaning for Pesach. This year there's a whole host of other issues that really need to be addressed um, and I'm delighted to be able to answer those questions live online. Uh, I'm able to hear you if you want to ask a question, but first uh, I want to focus, if I may, um, on on a number of issues that have uh, been weighing on my mind um, and particularly to do with the Seder. So a number of the people I've spoken to over the past few days have said that they are a little concerned about running a Seder for the first time. They've never done it before and they feel that it is important that they get guidance and they know exactly what they're doing and of course the script of the Seder is set out in the Haggadah, but if you've never done it before, you've never really looked at your Haggadah in that way before, because there's always somebody else leading the Seder, there are issues that are going to crop up, and, and I just want to address them, I want to talk about them. If it's stuff you've heard before, it doesn't matter if you've heard it before, it's always worth uh, going over it again. We call it, uh, in Hebrew, it's called Chazora. Go over something, it, it never does any harm, to repeat something to make sure that it's really uh, firm in your mind, you know exactly what it is that you need to do. So let's talk about the Seder. The Seder um, is really the high point of Pesach. That means that everything about Pesach is to commemorate and celebrate Yetziat Mitzrayim. And everything we do at the Seder, to some extent, is a reflection of the experience of Yetziat Mitzrayim which means that we somehow have to consider as if we ourselves left Egypt, were made into the, or was part of the Jewish nation, and that in that experience we are now liberated, we are now free, we are redeemed, and we are God's chosen people. The point is that Seder night puts together a series of different experiences and activities, actions, that are meant to create that feeling within us of Yetzias Mitzrayim, both in terms of the slavery that we experienced initially and the incredible redemption that we experienced at the end. And as part of that process, we do many different things on Seder night. Last week I gave a share, and you can access it online uh, on my website. And by the way, I do recommend people who want to know more about any aspect of Pesach to go onto my website. There is um, in the library section, if you go onto festivals and click on Pesach, you'll find multiple shiurim regarding Pesach, www.rabbidunner.com. You can find, uh, I mean, I don't know exactly how many there are, the 20, 30 shiurim and articles uh, relating to Pesach. I do recommend that you go on onto the website and listen to some of those shiurim in greater detail than I'm going to go into right now. But the aspect of the Seder which is so unique is that we have this question and answer format which is launched by Avodim Hayinu. In other words, we begin with Manishtana and that's something which is brought in a Mishnah and it's, a very, it's integral to the Seder that we have this concept of asking questions and it's only when we ask questions and express our interest in hearing an answer that we can begin with the answer which is Avodim Hayinu. It's not a lecture. This, we're not a sage on the stage uh, that we have to deliver a message to a quiet audience. It's an interactive experience. It's a, quite an incredible educational experience. That's what Seder night is really about and that's why many of the things that we do at Seder we don't do it any other time of the year. So, you know, if you, I know in Sukkot we sit in a sukkah, but there's one thing that we do. We sit in a sukkah, we shake the lulav. Once you've got the explanation for that, um, you move on and sukkah is sukkah. 
But when it comes to Pesach, the Seder night, it's full of curious activities, customs, uh, and uh, things that we need to do. Uh, and all of them are there to prompt us into imagining as if we ourselves emerged out of Egypt. You and me were in Egypt, and you and me came out of Egypt. That's what the Seder night is about. Now, um, I'm going to go through some of the aspects of the Seder in a moment, but I want to point you out to some fantastic resources which are available. Um, I, I, in fact, I have um, put them onto, uh, I'm, I think, uh, Carly, can we put them onto the website? Are we, we can put them onto the website. So we, I will put this resource list onto the website and Carly is going to do a screen share now to help you understand why each of these um, web pages is useful and helpful for you if you are conducting Seder for the first time. The first one is um, from Aish. Aish has put together a wonderful um, page which explains exactly how it is that you can run a Seder, Practical Guide to the Seder Night. Um, this link will be available on the website uh, um, after the shiur, but that's the first one which I want you to look at. Um, it's extremely useful, I've been through it and I found it very, very helpful. The second one to look at is um, the ncsy.org. Um, this is really incredible and it's a Passover Seder cheat sheet. For somebody who's never done the Seder before, you have the opportunity of having in front of you a cheat sheet. Of course, it's, we're kidding here, I mean, we're not taking an exam, but uh, you have in front of you a guide, very well put together, concise for each stage of the Seder. For example, I, I've got it here. Uh, you just print it out off the link. It's an incredible, um, there you go. Thank you, Carly, for that. Um, it's an incredible resource. Each aspect of the Seder is covered on this NCSY cheat sheet. Comes to Kaddish. We begin the Seder with Kiddush, recited over a full cup of wine, just we, as we do at the beginning of Shabbos and festivals. We drink the wine while reclining, etc. Et it gives you all. So if you are leading the Seder, you don't have to have um, gone over it in great detail before. You can have this sheet in front of you and it will enable you to conduct the Seder like a true professional. Of course, you can read it up before and be somewhat professional before that you're not ad-libbing, but nevertheless, I would highly recommend that you print this out, particularly if you are running a Seder for the first time. But even if you're not running the Seder for the first time, it's an extremely useful resource. The next resource I have on this sheet is um, from Chabad, um, Chabad.org. It's what is a Seder? and it gives the necessary guidance and information with regard to what Seder night is all about. Chabad has, over many, many years, put together an incredible range of resources on their website for people who are uninformed. Uh, they guide you at every stage of the way, and they offer you um, background information and explanations to whatever it is that you need to do from a Jewish perspective. So I do recommend that you go on to that as well. And finally, uh, and this is the one which I really, really think that everybody should go on. Um, uh, Carly, can you, can you do that one? It's Torah.org forward slash Passover forward slash Seder Guide. Again, this will be on the website. Um, it will be on the Shul website, www.yinbh.org. After the shear is over, we will post this. You'll be able to obtain this information. Uh, this particular web page uh, is uh, it's been put together in a very clever way so that you have all the different aspects of the Seder in front of you um, while you're going through it and you can just hit the plus sign and there's something that comes out that goes down etc that will give you the information that you need in order to conduct the Seder so uh, I'll, re I'll repeat that to you I don't know why Carly are you able to get it on Sharing. okay I'm not seeing it on mine for some reason um, okay, www.torah.org forward slash Passover forward slash Seder dash guide forward slash. So if you go to the top, um, you can see here, um, can you scroll down, Carly? So if you scroll, go back up to one of the, 
There you go. If you if you see that Kadesh making Kiddush, if you hit Kadesh making Kiddush, it will give you the information. And then if you hit it again, it will go back up. Then you go to Urchatz. If you hit that, it will give you the information for Urchatz, for washing your hands after Kiddush. Then you, if you hit it again, if you click on it again, it will go back up. You go to the next one, Karpas. So if there's any aspect of the Seder which you're not familiar with or which you need extra guidance for, this resource will give you that and it's extremely user-friendly. Uh, and if you've got no concept of what it is that you need to do for the Seder, or even if you have, you know, you've got a lot of experience in it, this is very, very helpful to guide you as to how you should do the Seder. Okay, um, those are the resources. Again, we'll post them online after the shear is over and they will be available to you. All of them are extremely useful and helpful. Um, we're also offering, um, we have um, obtained um, Rabbi Sachs uh, put together last year a Haggadah. It's incredible. We bought um, uh, quite a number of them and we are offering them, offering them here in Los Angeles free of charge to anybody who wants them. Obviously, you're welcome to give a donation to the shul, but we're not asking for any amount of money to obtain this. All you need to do is tell us that you want one and they'll be waiting for you here at the office um, in the shul. Uh, and again, it's an incredible publication with Chief Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, the former Chief Rabbi of the United Kingdom, um, put together his own commentary and a lot of explanation. It's published by Koren. It's the, um, it's the Koren Haggadah with commentary by Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs. And we are making it available to anyone here in Los Angeles who wants it. And if you want to obtain it wherever you are, if you're still able to get it before Yom Tov, I, I, I use it. I used it last year. I'm going to use it this year. It is uh, full of fascinating commentary uh, that is extremely helpful. You just need to read it up. We've all unfortunately got a lot of time on our hands. Um, it would be well worth spending the time reading Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs' commentary on the Haggadah so that you can familiarize yourself with some of the background to what it is that we do on Seder night and explanations to the various aspects of Magid in particular when we tell the story of uh, of the Yitziat Mitzrayim, of the Exodus from Egypt, and we can uh, um, uh, apply that to some of the stuff that we talk about on Seder night with however small the group is, but with a group of people that we are with on Seder night. So, and finally, um, I have this here, which is something which I obtained many, many years ago, and it gives the different sizes for what you're meant to be eating on Seder night with regard to the amount of matzah, and mora, we're going to talk about mora in a moment, um, and also tells you what it is that you can use. I'm not sure exactly um, how I can get this to you, perhaps um, Carly can scan it and we can make it available to those of you who ask us for it. Thank you, Carly. Um, we'll have this scanned uh, and we can send it to you. Uh, just email Carly at yinbh.org and she will respond to you um, with an email which will have this as an attachment. So uh, just to give you an example of what this tells us is, for example, we don't know exactly how much we are meant to drink. But there's always some expert at our Seder that can tell us how much wine we're meant to drink with, with each kois, but this year we may not have that expert because we're all isolated. We may even be on our own. So um, the size of the cup for example, this is what it says here on this, uh, on this card, has to be at least 3.3 fluid ounces, which is 97.6 milliliters, just under 100 milliliters. It should be filled to capacity. That means as close to the top as you can get it. It doesn't need to be spilling over, but as far to the top as you can get it. Um, and uh, you should drink as much of the cup as you can and preferably all of it. Now, one of the questions which I am asked every year is, do we need to drink wine at the Seder? And it's certainly true that the Shulchan Aruch prefers wine, and there are different minhagim. Some people say you should drink white wine. Some people think you should drink red wine. I think any wine is okay to drink at Seder night, but some people either don't want to drink alcohol or cannot tolerate alcohol, in which case you're certainly allowed to drink grape juice. Um, if at all possible, you should put 
a drop of wine in there so that you're drinking wine that there's some level of wine in the cup when you're drinking it but you you do not need to drink four cups of wine we begin the seder with the kiddush and it's going to be quite a long time until you eat so if you're going to be very makbid on drinking a full cup of wine at the beginning of the seder on an empty stomach and it's going to be some time until you eat you may get a little heady um, and fuzzy and that's not an appropriate state of mind to be in when you're conducting the seder so if at all possible um, it would certainly be more advisable to drink something that's not going to make you light-headed and uh, if that means that at least the first cup and even the second cup is going to be grape juice that's fine when it comes to the final two cups you can drink wine because at that stage it's not going to matter as much um, with regard to matzah and I think I've covered this in an earlier shear, but I'm going to say it again I've had a number of calls since then should we have shmura matzah at the seder so uh, um, for some people it might be difficult to get out to buy matzah for that for others that's not a problem at all uh, you do not need to eat hand-baked shmura matzah at the seder it's not a requirement you should have shmura matzah at the seder but any matzah which is made for pesach as far as i understand and i've made inquiries since my last year as far as I, as far as i understand all manufacturers of matzah doesn't matter if you're in um, America or in Israel or anywhere else, if it's Yehuda Matzah or if it's Straits or Manishevitz or any of the Matzah manufacturers, if they are making Matzah for Pesach, even if they're not using Shmura flour and they're using the regular flour, all Matzah is made with the intention for it to be used as Matzah's Mitzvah. That means you can use it at Seder night. So if you're not able to obtain sufficient Shmura, hand baked Shmura Matzah, for everybody to have a full Kazais of Matzah, at Seder night from the ham baked matzah, you can augment that with the non shmura machine baked matzah, and that is no problem at all. The main thing is you need to eat matzah on Pesach. We have to eat the matzah on Pesach. It's one of the obligations of Pesach night. Unfortunately, we're not able to eat Korban Pesach, but we are certainly able to eat matzah and we are able to eat mora. So let me get on to mora because this has been the subject of great debates and particularly over the last week uh, on uh, two of the groups that I'm on, the rabbi groups that I'm on, there's been a discussion about um, which vegetable one can use for moror. But before I get to that, let me talk about karpas. Kar karpas, notwithstanding your custom, can be absolutely any vegetable. It can be a vegetable that's not mentioned anywhere in halacha. The point of karpas is not the vegetable, but it's a vegetable that's dipped in salt water as a prelude to the seder, as a way of demonstrating that we are in a fancy meal. Because at the time that the, um, the seder was set up, that means the concept of the seder was set up for us to perform or to do on Pesach night, they uh, that was the time when Romans used to recline when they eat and that's why we recline when we eat on Pesach night and it was a time when Romans would begin their meal by dipping vegetables into some type of dip it could be salt water, it could be anything else um, and that was set up now depending where you came from as to what vegetable you used so if you came from Eastern Europe you used potatoes but you know potatoes was not a vegetable that was readily available 2,000 years ago in Eretz Yisrael. Nevertheless, it became the custom that people use potatoes. Where I come from, um, I came from Northern Europe. Uh, um, my mother was Dutch, my father was German. We used to have radish uh, and we used to have parsley. We never had potato. And uh, that's what we had every year for karpas. Other people use stalks of celery. I've seen people use carrots for karpas at the Seder and it doesn't really matter. Whatever vegetable is available, if you want to use peppers, use peppers. If you want to use any type of vegetable that is available for you in this particular year when circumstances are difficult and you may not be able to get the vegetable of your choice, which is the normal custom that you are, you are used to, you can use absolutely any vegetable for karpas. Let's get back to maror. Maror has to be a bitter vegetable. And the vegetable which is mentioned is called chazeres. And according to Chacham Tzvi, chazeres is salad. 
Uh, it's the type of salad that we are familiar with from Europe, and of course it's spread all over the world. Salad means lettuce. Rav Moshe Feinstein was extremely fussy about using romaine lettuce. One year, we were not able in the UK to obtain romaine lettuce. I can't remember how long ago it was. It was before Rav Moshe Feinstein died, because I do remember that there was a great discussion in the Dunna household about the fact that we were using iceberg lettuce, although we'd used it in the years before that. But uh, my father called Rav Moshe Feinstein I would think it was around 1981, 82, 83, I don't remember exactly the year. And Ramosha Feinstein answered the phone and he said, we're only able to use iceberg lettuce, you seem to be very fussy about using romaine lettuce. And Ramosha Feinstein says, eat lettuce, whatever lettuce you have, so sei mit Hatzlocha, good yomtuf. And that was the phone call. So you can use any lettuce for, for um, chazeres, for morer. Now, the question I am asked, every single year, and I'm being asked it again this year, is that lettuce isn't bitter, which is why we have horseradish. I'm going to get to horseradish in a minute, but it's not about the lettuce being bitter, uh, because it doesn't mean that when you eat it, it is bitter. As long as there is a part of the lettuce, whether it's the stalk, whether, I don't know what it is, in the lettuce that's bitter, or whether it's been genet genetically modified over many centuries not to be bitter so that we don't um, cringe when we eat our salad, I have no idea. That is the vegetable that was designated as the bitter herb that we have on Pesach night, whether or not it is bitter. So it has nothing to do with the flavor of the lettuce, it has to do with the fact that it is lettuce and that's what we have for morrow. Let's now talk about horseradish. Horseradish is a European vegetable. I would suspect that at some point um, you know, maybe it was one of those early Pesachs a few hundred years ago and there was no lettuce available wherever they were in Central or Eastern Europe and they needed to find a bitter herb and they knew that horseradish, which was something that they had with their gefilte fish on a regular basis, was bitter and therefore they used horseradish as the morrow for, um, for Pesach. There's no mention of horseradish anywhere in the Mishnah. Um, uh, because it probably didn't exist. But nevertheless, it has become the accepted minhag for people to add horseradish to the lettuce so that it is bitter when they have it on Pesach night at the Seder. What happens if this year, because we're not able to get out, uh, or even if we do get out, there's no availability of horseradish in the stores and therefore we're not able to use horseradish for morrow on Seder night, what should we do? The answer is, it doesn't matter. As long as you have lettuce and you dip it into charoses and you make the bracha ala chilas maror, that is sufficient and you have discharged your obligation to eat maror with lettuce. There was some discussion this morning about chicory, which in America is known as endives, um, which is another form of leaf vegetable which you eat, and whether or not endives or chicory can be used for maror. And it would seem that there is an existing minhag that allows for endives, chicory, to be used for mara. Therefore, if you're not able to obtain horseradish and you want to have some type of bitter taste, you can certainly add endives, chicory leaves to your mara and have that on Seder night, and that is fine. What about any other bitter herbs? That's more problematic. I would think that um, one should stick with what one knows, um, which are the three which I have mentioned. And if you're not able to obtain those, that would be extremely surprising. But if you're not, for some reason, wherever you are, not able to obtain either lettuce, whether it's iceberg, or, or whether it's the other lettuce, or whether it's endives, or it's um, horseradish, you're not able to obtain any of those things, please be in touch with me, private message me, and we can discuss what to do. I would think that's extremely unli unlikely. I don't expect that my WhatsApp and SMS is going to be clogged by messages from people who cannot get lettuce for Pesach. So romaine lettuce, iceberg lettuce, endives and horseradish, those are the four choices that you have for morrow on Seder night. Um, I think I've covered every aspect of what one needs for Seder. Um, I've, uh, I think, Carly, have we posted the 
um, Haroses recipe online. Okay, so for those of you who have never made Haroses before, I've prepared a recipe card uh, which, uh, which we can either send you by WhatsApp or we can send it to you uh, um, online in an email. Um, I know it's available on our website uh, and therefore you can look at that. It's not a complicated recipe, believe me, because if it was, I couldn't make it. And I do make it every year. And that's, thank you very much, Carly, for that. That's the recipe for haroses. Uh, and uh, when we dip the mora initially into haroses, we shake a bit of, we shake it off. So we don't want the bitterness to be too bitter. On the other hand, we don't want the sweetness to overtake the bitterness. That is the message of Pesach that we always ha have there hovering in the background. The idea of, of Avodim Hayinu Lefarab Mitzrayim, but nevertheless, Vayotzienu Hashem Alekeinu Misham. God took us out of there. So even as we're eating Morar, we have Haroses. Even as we know that we are experiencing that feeling of slavery, we still nevertheless have the sweetness because we know that God freed us and He brought us out of Egypt and sent us onwards to receive the Torah and towards the Promised Land. So Haroses and Mora encapsulate the entire Seder experience. Let me talk now about trying to find um, aspects of the Seder which can be helpful to us as we go through it. Um, I have two general broad brush themes that I use uh, as somebody who conducts Sedorim. Now, I've conducted Sedorim Seders for 200 plus people. I've conducted Sedorim for far less than that. I think this year will be the smallest Seder that I'm ever having, um, I've ever had, because it will be less than 10 people, probably six or seven people, and it be a, a, a totally different atmosphere for me. But I'm sure for some of you um, who are having smaller Sedorim, um, and for some of you who have never conducted a Seder before, you want some guidance as to how you should conduct a Seder. What is it as a Seder leader, as the person who's running the Seder, what should you focus on? You don't have to read every Dvar Torah in the Lord, Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs Haggadah in order to do what you have to do. You can just pick things out, but what should you be picking out? What are the themes that you should focus on at Seder night? I, generally speaking, focus on two themes. The first theme is the idea of me'afela la'ira mishibud li'geula. From darkness into light and from slavery into redemption. All aspects of the Seder are a reflection of one of those two aspects of the story of the Exodus. Either they are a reflection of Afela, Shibud, or they are a reflection of Oira and Geula. The question is, when you're doing it, how do you relate to that aspect of the Seder? There are some unique aspects of the Seder which are both. So, for example, eating matzah, matzah is both the bread of affliction and it's also the bread of redemption. It is a reflection of the fact that when we were poor and lived in great poverty and difficulty and penury in Egypt, that the bread that we ate was matzah. It is also a reflection of the haste of redemption because when we were finally allowed to leave Egypt, we were only able to make the dough. We couldn't let it rise so that it could become bread. So matzah uniquely is a reflection of both aspects, both afela and oira, shibud and geula. So that's one thing. But when you come, for example, to moror, moror is a reflection of, of the sadness, of the affliction, of the difficulty, of the slavery. So that's what we're meant to be thinking. When we drink wine, we're meant to be thinking of the fact that we are um, free and we live in redemption, having been redeemed from the slavery of Egypt. How about the fact that we are still in Galut? How about the fact that Mashiach hasn't come and we don't have a Beit HaMikdash? How are we meant to celebrate redemption when we are in fact not in a fully redeemed state? So the answer to that question is very, very simple. As Jews, we are redeemed. It doesn't matter whether we are living in a status of redemption 
Before we were redeemed from Egypt, we were not yet God's chosen nation. We were descendants of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, who had been promised redemption and been promised that we would be given the Torah and the Holy Land. Once we were redeemed from Egypt, once we came out of there, at that moment, at the stroke of midnight, we became the Jewish nation for all time. And it doesn't matter if we're living through terrible difficulties or if we're living at a time when everything is going well. You know, for a Jew who lived at the time of King Solomon, of Shlomo HaMelech, they never had it so good. They had a beautiful Beis Amikdosh, they had a powerful king, and one of the most um, in, uh, powerful empires of the Middle East at that time. So they could, on Pesach, celebrate knowing that they were no longer in any respect in a status of Afela and Shibud. They were only in a status of Oira and Geula. Nevertheless, at subsequent moments in Jewish history, and in fact most subsequent Pesachs, almost all the Pesachs we've ever commemorated, have been in somewhat a state of um, Afela, in somewhat a state of Shibud. Nevertheless, that is not what we're talking about in terms of Afela and Shibud. The moment we became servants of God, a mo the moment we changed from Avodim Hayinu, Lefare B'Mitzrayim, and Vayoytzienu Hashem Alekeinu Misham, that God Himself brought us out. And it was Him who did it and not a Malach, him who did it and not a sorrow. Loy al Shaliach. God Himself has chosen us to be His people, His chosen nation. At that moment, notwithstanding any situation we may find ourselves in at any point in Jewish history, we are free and that's the redemption that we are celebrating. So when we drink the cup of wine, not one, but four at Seder night, and by the way, you can add to that any cups of wine or glasses of wine that you're going to drink along with your meal when you have Shulchan Aruch, and you lean back and you say, Ah, I am a servant of God, I'm no longer a servant of Pharaoh, that is an expression of redemption. That is an expression of Geula, an expression of light, of Ura. And that is what we are commemorating and celebrating on Pesach night, notwithstanding. And this year, of course, many of us are caught in our own homes. To some extent, we are incarcerated, we are subjected to um, to conditions which do not allow us, allow us out of our homes except to go and buy food or whatever it is. We may feel like Avodim. That is not the Avdus that is being described. The Avdus of Mitzrayim was one which was devoid of God, devoid of nationhood and devoid of our land. We now live wherever we live in the knowledge that we have our land, the land of Israel. Today we in fact have control over the land of Israel with Medinat Israel, with the state of Israel. And we are able to celebrate our identity as Jews in a way that no Jew in Egypt could, could ever celebrate. And that is the purpose of Seder night, that we should celebrate our moment of Geula, our moment of nationhood, our moment of uh, individual identity as opposed to every other nation in the world. So that's why we lean back and drink the wine and we celebrate. When it comes to Moror, we don't lean back. Why? Because at that moment, the purpose of the Seder is to remember the Shibud Mitzrayim, to remember what it means to be a slave. So we sit ramrod straight and we eat a bitter herb, even though it's slightly dipped in the Charoses, which we've had to shake off. Nevertheless, we continue to remember and to recall what Shibud means. So we have this theme that is the overriding, overarching theme that runs right the way through the Seder. It's a theme of two ideas, an idea of Avodim Hayinu Lefarei B'Mitzrayim and a theme of Vayetzienu Hashem Elokeinu Misham that God brought us out of there. So in each aspect of the Seder, as the Seder leader, you should be looking, what is this a reflection of? Does this reflect one side of our experience tonight or what we should be experiencing tonight or does it reflect the other side of what we should be experiencing tonight? That's one aspect of the Seder, which I think is extremely useful and it runs right the way through from the moment of Kiddush until the end of Chad Gadya. By the way, if you want to have a full explanation of this very strange tune that we sing at the end of the Seder, Chad Gadya, 
I think that uh, we posted a share about it last week that I gave either a year or two ago, and I'm very happy to share it with you if you're not on my podcast list. If you want to know a little bit more about the strange ditty, Chadgadio and its origins, I'm very happy to share that share with you. I think you'll find it extremely informative. I think it comes in two parts. Uh, and just let me know, WhatsApp me, and I'm happy to send it to you uh, by WhatsApp. Let's get to the second theme that runs right the way through the Seder. I would tell you, as an educator, I'm a Jewish educator. In fact, you know, I always say, I am a teacher masquerading as a rabbi. The point is that the central theme of Seder night, it's a teaching opportunity. We do stuff at the Seder that we never do throughout the year because we want to use it as a springboard, as a platform to teach those who are at the Seder and ourselves about aspects of history. And we use props that are there to teach us. Matzah is a prop. Moror is a prop. When we sit around a table and we don't eat after Kiddush, that's an educational prompt. Why aren't we eating now? Why are we waiting? What are we doing? When we hold up the matzah and we say, Holach ma'anya, and we use a strange language, a language which is Aramaic and not Hebrew, we're meant to ask ourselves, why are we using a strange language in the middle of a seder? When we sing the song Dayenu, which goes through 15 different levels of, of why it would have been enough for us, we can ask ourselves at each different stage, what are you talking about? It wasn't enough. We needed more. Why would that have been Dayenu? It's all a learning experience. It's a learning platform. And we become teachers. So even though you may have never had any kind of educational training, Seder night is a script. It's a lesson plan for you as a teacher to teach those at the Seder more about the Jewish experience and more about Jewish history in respect of what it means to be a Jew in the circumstances of Pesach when we celebrate redemption. That is the purpose of the Seder. So those two themes that run throughout the Seder are, first of all, from darkness to light and from slavery into redemption. That's the first theme that is reflected throughout the Seder. And the second theme is, this is an educational experience. How does this aspect of the Seder teach me something? What can I learn from it? And we should all be learning from every aspect of the Seder. That's what we should be doing and we should be teaching, if at all possible, those at the Seder who may not get those prompts and not be able to use that platform, we should be teaching them what we have learnt as a result of any aspect of the Seder that we're going through. Um, so, I'm now going to deal with questions. I'm going to open up for questions for those of you who want to ask. The first question um, I'm being asked, which, and I don't have the answer to it, uh, I'm going to have to check it out online, is cellulose as an ingredient and what other medications are there for headache? I don't know about medications. I do know, and I think that um, uh, I will look at this after the shear. There's a number of lists of kosher medications for Pesach, and I will see if I can get hold of those lists and post them onto the website, and um, hopefully we'll be able to share that information with you as to whether or not certain um, ingredients in medications can be used for Pesach. The one thing I'll say about medications is as follows. If you have a life-threatening condition of any sort, and by the way, life-threatening condition is diabetes, and you need to take diabetes medication, um, you cannot take a break from diabetes medication for a week. There may be availability of diabetes medication and any other medication for life-threatening disease, which is chomates free. If at all possible, that's the medication one should be using. However, this year, if it's not possible in any way, shape or form to get hold of medication that's free of chomates, then of course, for a life-saving sa medication, you can take the chomates one because it's, it's not considered um, achila. It is considered something that is done for me medical purposes. And although ordinarily, ordinarily, we would not allow one to use such medication on Pesach if it was possible to obtain an alternative, 
Clearly, if no alternative is available, that is the medication you need to take. If you have any individual questions about such medication, please WhatsApp me or call me. I'm happy to answer them. If it's non-life-threatening, so for example, you suffer from a headache, or you're, you've got to, you know, some difficulty that you're having to deal with, some pain, do not take um, any medication which contains chametz. You shouldn't do that. Uh, and you should try, and, the, and that's what the list is for, you should try and find a medication which doesn't contain chametz. Um, and let me have a look here at the chat if there is any more questions. Yeah, Tammy, thank you for that. Rabbi, will you be giving a share on the readings and rituals of Pesach morning when we'd normally participate at shul? Yes, I will. I, will, uh, I don't know if I'll give a share or if I'll write it up, but I will be sharing information about the readings for Pesach that we're going to have to be doing on our own this year. Um, Samantha B is asking, does bottled horseradish have to say kosher for Passover? Yes, it does. It ha will have to be prepared for Pesach because um, it could contain non-kosher for Passover ingredients which would rather defeat the purpose. I did see here in the stores in California that it is available and again um, if, if there's any issue with that please let me know and I will, uh, I will address it privately with you if, you if you WhatsApp me or call me. Are there any other questions um, which you want to post on the chat or which you'd like to uh, ask me uh, on uh, live? So uh, I'm, not, uh, I'm not hearing any questions. I'm grateful to all those who participated in the share. Someone's talking, I'm not hearing it. Oh. Anati. Um, again, is that Nati? Yeah, yeah, the Kiddush, the Becher. Yes, what would you like to do with it? What, should I it? Yeah, so I covered that in the previous share. The way to kasher it is take a chometz pot, but one um, which is not does never has chometz in it, and you boil water until it's boiling, and you has to stay boiling, and then you put the um, put the cup in it, uh, and you leave it inside the pot, and you take a very hot piece of metal, stick it inside the pot of water that's actually boiling, and, and it fizzes. And in that situation, the cup, which has obviously been thoroughly cleaned and polished before, becomes kosher for Pesach. If you want to have more details on that, I, I, was, I went into much more detail in the previous share. Any other questions? Hi, um, I just want to know, um, usually every year I clean clearly. Yes. Okay. Usually every year um, I clean every single cupboard out, etc., etc., but this year, I mean, I'll do it anyway, but just for people who have got are completely overwhelmed, do they have to like clean every single cup down, even if you're keeping stuff which is um, chromate on paper? It's not only so. There's absolutely no need to get rid of all your chromates if you're selling your chromates for Pesach, and you can sell it. Um, you can do it online. Um, I will be selling all the chametz for the community, and it doesn't matter where you live in the world. I will be selling the chametz to Daryl, who's our Gentile facilities manager. He will be making a Kenyan, and he will be buying all of your chametz. Uh, that means that if you have a cupboard which is generally used for chametz purposes, and it's going to be hard for you this year because of the prevailing circumstances to clean out every cupboard as you would normally do every year, it's absolutely no issue for you to leave that cupboard closed, to mark it as chometz, to make sure that it is locked in some way, by either by putting tape on it or tying it up with a string, so that people know that they shouldn't be accessing it on Pesach, and that it is one of those closets or cupboards that's been sold to the non-Jew, who is buying the chometz that it, that it contains. And this year in particular, because we don't know about food shortages after Pesach, um, the rabbis are all saying that even if you are used to not selling chometz gomor, which for example is bread, um, over Pesach, that you shouldn't have it in your property, even if it's sold to a non-Jew, you shouldn't have it in your property over Pesach. This year they're waiving that restriction for those who have the custom to 
get rid of Chomet Gomor for Pesach, this year you are allowed to keep it and include it among the Chomets that sold for a non-Jew. The only thing you need to worry about if you're cleaning for Pesach is that the surfaces that you use and the food that you eat is all kosher for Pesach. That is what you have to concern yourself. It's not spring cleaning and you do not need to get rid of all your chametz because we have this opportunity to sell chametz. If you are in your kitchen going to be using a surface or a pot or a pan or a plate or any item of silverware, clearly all of those things need to have been koshered for Pesach or designated for Pesach exclusively. But if you have in your home pots and pans which are chametz and you know usually you would take them out and clean them and thoroughly make sure that there's no crumb or anything in them but this year it's not possible for you to do so because of the prevailing circumstances therefore you do not need to worry about that you can sell all the chametz that you have to the non-jew and you can be mavatel the chametz on thursday night uh, sorry on the on Tuesday night before Pesach and on Wednesday morning when you burn the chametz, whatever however you're going to do that, uh, and that would be sufficient to make sure that your possessions are chametz free, entirely chametz free for Pesach. That is what you need to worry about, that your food supply is not contaminated by chametz. Are there any other questions? But, so even if, let's say, for example, you've got one fridge and you've gone to keep stuff which is, which is basically homemade, okay? Can you cover that stuff and put that stuff in a bag, wrap it up twice, and like sort of say homemade on it, but still keep it in your fridge over paper? Certainly. Certainly, you can keep stuff in your fridge, in your freezer, which is chametz gomor, as long as you've identified it as food items that have been included in the chametz sale to the non-Jew who, to whom the chametz has been sold. But you, can, you still have to clean the whole fridge. You have to clean out the fridge to make sure that any food that you have in the fridge is not going to come into contact with some element of chametz residue that may be in the fridge if you hadn't cleaned it. So you should be cleaning all the shelves and covering any of the shelves that you're using for, um, for Pesach so that, you can, um, so that you can use the fridge. But that doesn't mean that you have to get rid of all the chametz out of the refrigerator. You can, some items need to be refrigerated. Just put them in a double wrapping uh, in two um, plastic bags in the fridge, mark it chametz, make sure that it's, it's tied in, you know, the top is tied in a knot so that if you've got um, hungry children, they're not going to uh, just put their hands into the bag and take the food that they will know that it's chametz. It has to be clearly marked in a way that, you know, that cannot, no mistake can be made that this item is chametz and should not be consumed on Pesach. Thank you. Let me ask you, boil silicone? Um, on the chat. I don't know the answer to that. I'm going to have to find out. Can we boil silicone? I don't know. I'm going to have to look into that and I will get back to you, Tammy. Thank you for as asking the question. Any other questions? Okay, so I think we've covered a lot of ground today. If there's any particular aspect of Pesach, both in terms of cleaning for Pesach and in terms of the Seder or the Yomta for Pesach that you want me to cover in my next year, which will be on Sunday, and that will be the last year before Pesach, will be Sunday at 11 a.m., please let me know. Don't be shy to reach out to me either by email rabbi at yinbh.org or by WhatsApp, my phone number is 310-499-3407. I'm very happy to cover any ground that needs to be covered before Pesach so that we can uh, address all the issues that you may be wondering about and cover every aspect of it, uh, that you are comfortable coming into Pesach, that you know what's going on, you know what you're doing, and you know what has to be done. Thank you so much, and thank you for listening. All the best. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank, thank you. you, Rabbi. Thank you.